Hello everyone, my name is Aiden Crenshaw, and my presentation for today is uh, Darknets, an overview of attack strategies. First of all, a little bit about me for anybody who hasn't been before my presentations before, I'll make this brief. Uh, my name is Aiden Crenshaw, I run irongeek.com. I have an interest in InfoSec education. I don't know everything, I'm just a geek with time on my hands. It's possible I'll get a few things wrong. If so, let me know, I'd be interested in knowing that technical uh, details of what exactly is going on. And I'm a regular on the ISD podcast, usually every Thursday. I'm also a researcher for the Nasty Institute. All right, a little background. First of all, what technologies is this talk going to be about? Darknets, there's like a million definitions, but my particular one is essentially anonymizing networks. Generally speaking, they use encryption and proxies or systems of uh, several nodes to where you cascade through them to hide who's actually who and who's communicating with who on a network. They're sometimes also referred to as cypherspaces, which I kind of like this term better. Darknet means different things to different people. Like sometimes people use the term darknet when they mean only friend to friend, not necessarily a general open cypherspace where anybody can connect like Tor is or IHP is. However, inside each one of those networks, you could possibly have a darknet in the other sense where it's only friend to friend. I'm using darknet in the broader sense of Tor in general, I2P in general, and so forth. And I just use the term Tor and I2P a lot here. Those are the two darknets I'm going to be talking the most about. It's a bunch of other ones that have been you know, cooked up by academia, but these two seem to have gotten major deployment. So those will be the ones I use whenever I uh, need to use an example. We seem to my knowledge, they're the two biggest uh, contenders out in this particular space. And I say contenders, they're not necessarily in competition. They both have slightly different focuses, which we'll go into here in a bit. Uh, a few notes. A lot of the stuff gets subtle. A lot of the attacks get subtle, and getting them to actually function uh, might be a crapshoot. Uh, terms vary from researcher to researcher, so you'll go out there and uh, read terms in academia and like, okay, what do you mean by this? Like, I'm pulling up the term civil and sock puppet. I'd be more familiar with the term sock puppet. Other people, until I started looking into uh, research in academia, I never heard the term civil. We'll be covering that here in a bit. Uh, many of these weaknesses are interrelated, and sometimes one weakness can be used with another weakness to greatly amplify the attack and be able to uh, get past someone's anonymity. And uh, there's a bunch of other anonymizing networks out there. Uh, just to name a few, here's a few, uh, Morphmix, Tarzan, Mix Minion, and so forth. But like I said, IQP and Tor are the two that I've played the most with, and they seem to have the most foothold. Also, I'm going to try to go more um, real world with some of these attacks that could actually be used versus some of the academic stuff. I will be talking about traffic analysis attacks, but um, I really think application level attacks is probably where the biggest risk is to anybody using one of these networks. Uh, threat model. You can't protect against everything. I mean, a threat, if a darkness is not going to protect you from someone seeing your house looking over your shoulder at your monitor. That's just the way it is. And it's not going to protect you necessarily, depending on the darknet, from uh, a state agency that could actually, in theory, uh, get ISP records from all ISPs in the United States. Or let's go with a smaller country. United States, that gets a lot more difficulty. A lot more difficult. They talk about the internet kill switch. In the United States, that's a lot harder than it is in a country like Iran. Uh, but depending on who your adversary is, there's different threat models. You know, some protocols there needs to be a lost cause. I'll be talking about that here in a bit. Most of the people who are using these darknets are using HTTP-based protocols. But there are other things, and uh, some of these protocols, like BitTorrent, unless you do some heavy modification, yeah, it's kind of a lost cause. Uh, some users may end up doing things to reveal themselves. For instance, Tor's model, uh, if you go out and use certain protocols that give away your identity, or you use the same name on Tor hidden services as you do on the public internet, it's not, nothing there is going to protect you. Or if you uh, allow six billion different plugins in your browser, and you start surfing around websites with Tor, there's no guarantee that it's going to protect you. Also, different attacks give different levels of information. Some just give uh, details about uh, the client host, who it is, the IP address. And if you have the IP address, true IP address, 
you can find more information. Sometimes it just reduces the abnormality set. But what I mean by this is it reduces the total number of people it could possibly be. Like, you may not, instead of being, it's an IGP user, you might say, it's an IGP user in Indiana. That's be an example of reducing someone's anonymity set. Or possibly because of the posts they make and the things they say or the time they make it, you can get an idea of where in the world they are. There's also active versus the passive attackers. There's attackers who can actually sit there and mess up the network to be able to uh, find out more information. Passive attackers are people who just sit there and sniff the traffic but don't necessarily modify it. Location, location, location. This kind of goes into the whole active versus passive. Whether or not someone's inside the network already and seeing traffic or if they're outside of it, like let's say the ISP. Uh, adversaries, of course, vary by power. There's nation states, like I mentioned before. Depending on how draconian the laws are in that particular country, that makes a huge difference. Also, the size of the infrastructure. For instance, Western democracies, you're probably a whole lot safer than in some other countries. Uh, government agencies have with limited resources, depends on what they have. I mean, if they have the power, in theory, to uh, maybe get, uh, I guess the term might be subpoena, uh, to say, all right, give me all your records from this ISP, give me all the records from this ISP, give me all the records from this ISP to figure out where all this traffic's bouncing through, then I'm not sure they'd be able to necessarily track it all down. Uh, could be someone with uh, who runs an ISP, or it could be someone that runs a whole lot of nodes. Are we talking about civil and sock puppets later on? Uh, to give you a quick overview of what that is, though, essentially someone controls more than one node in the network, and they can start having those uh, nodes collude to find out more information. There's still private interest groups that might be interested. For instance, uh, RIAA and the MPAA. These people generally aren't going to be able to, you know, get a tap on your internet connection directly. And there's um, people like me, schmucks with extra time on their hands. Now, I went into, um, in my last aid talk, a whole lot more into darknets. I'm going to go briefly cover two major ones, Tor and ITP, just so the rest of the slides make some kind of sense. Most people give you no diagrams with a circle here, a circle here with lines between them. I don't like to do that. I like to do something a little bit more um, whimsical. So this is my idea of a no diagram for Tor. Essentially, you have something that bounces around the network. You have, by default, in a tunnel, you have... Let's say free hops. Let's say uh, this is you right here. You might talk to the directory server. It would give you different Tor routers you can go through. You make a connection to one, make a connection to another, make a connection to a third one. And you make the connection through the circuit. That way they don't know who you originated from. And there's a level of encryption here, a level of encryption here, and a level of encryption here, which I'll explain shortly. Essentially, it's called the onion router, Tor, because it has layers. Just like an ogre. <laughs> Think of Chinese nesting dolls. IGP is a little bit different. IGP, you have one directional tunnel, so you have in tunnels and out tunnels. You may have multiple ones, and your in tunnel or your out tunnel eventually goes into someone else's in tunnel. For instance, let's say this is the server, this is my client here. I could be going through and out my out tunnel back into someone else's in tunnel. They set the link of this tunnel. I set the link of that tunnel. IGP allows you to make uh, compromises between like latency and uh, anonymity. Obviously, the longer the number of hops you have, probably the more anonymous you're going to be, but the longer it will take. Um, and all the traffic that comes back in a different direction. This makes some traffic analysis attacks a whole hell of a lot harder, at least for my personal feeble attempts. There's probably government agencies that have a much better <laughs> handle on this than I've got, at least one would assume. Uh, but these one-way tunnels complicate things greatly as far as doing traffic analysis. By the way, uh, I'll explain more about traffic analysis here in a bit, but you, let's say you don't know uh, who's been in the military. You're familiar with signals intelligence. Even if you don't know what the traffic is, you know this person at this base just sent a bunch of communication to these folks, and these folks started moving. Even if you don't know what that communication was, it tells you something. Well, in traffic analysis, since you're watching the traffic, even if it's all encrypted, to figure out who's talking to who, timings, and other things that could possibly reveal information. IGP differs from Tor in a few ways, though. Tor, generally speaking, you're supposed to connect to it to connect to uh, some website out on the public internet. There's something called Tor Hidden Services, where you can hide something inside the Tor cloud. I hate the term cloud, but it's semi-applicable here. Well, IGP, you can proxy out to the public internet, but only if someone provides an out proxy, 
generally speaking, its focus is hidden service text functions. Uh, so you have, uh, for instance, eat sites or a type of uh, service that you can hide inside of I2P that is a website. But you can also hide other protocols like uh, IRC and whatnot. Uh, also, it layers things a little bit different, and one of its big focuses is uh, to be distributed. And I'll talk a bit this in a little bit. Well, actually, let me see if I can uh, get back a second. Underneath my Tor slides, you notice I showed talking to a directory server. This directory server is controlled by the folks that created the Tor project. And other people can actually fork Tor and make their own sub-Tor networks after a fashion. Uh, if anybody has an iron key, they have their own Tor-based network. But since you have this central bit of infrastructure, someone has control over it. If someone takes up this directory server, that causes issue. Well, ITP wanted to avoid that, so it tried to be very distributed. ITP, like Tor, also has multiple levels of encryption. Essentially, any time you have at least three levels of encryption, you know, essentially end-to-end -end between the, this participant and this participant, they're trying to communicate, and also on the tunnel level, on in and out, and also between each and every single hop. So, in theory, no one but the endpoint and exit point can see what the traffic is supposed to be. Now, here's my silly garlic routing a uh, animation. Essentially, the way garlic routing, this is what I2P does. I explained a little bit about onion routing a little a bit ago, how it's like Chinese nesting dolls. Uh, it's similar in uh, I2P. Essentially, though, imagine each one of these levels, like a layer is stripped on or put on, and then, I'm, let me back this up a little bit. It sends something out to the exit point or the end point of a tunnel, and that might get sent into someone else's in tunnel. So just because it's going out to your particular out tunnel may mean it's going into multiple different in tunnels. Unlike Tor, we have one single circuit. Once that hits the end of a tunnel, my understanding, the different cloves, and this is why it's called garlic, each clove of that piece of garlic could here you go, okay, you go to this particular uh, end point of this other end tunnel, you go to this one, you go to this one. Once again, confusing the living hell out of traffic analysis. Alright, that's essentially how ITP and Tor differ. Now we'll actually get into some common weaknesses. These are going to be semi non-specific, but just to give you an idea, if you ever look at the literature, some of the attacks that are out there against these anonymizing networks. By the way, make, uh, give me a gauge for the crowd. How many people have ever used uh, Tor? Okay, how many people have ever used ITP? I need to change that. I, you, you have? Good, Dave. Good. <laughs> I just reduced his ad admin that he said. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tor has a whole lot more foothold, uh, but ITP is a fun project as well, so I highly recommend people give it uh, a chance. But... This first one is going to be more Tor centric. It's uh, about untrusted exit points. Essentially, what uh, untrusted exit point is, anybody can become a Tor router. So, if I want to become a Tor router at my home, I can just set myself up as an exit point, and well, some traffic will be routed through me, and some I'll be the exit point and be the out spot where traffic just comes through me and then goes out to the public internet. The problem is, depending on the traffic they're sending, that might be unencrypted. It's encrypted throughout the entire Tor network, but once it hits me and I'm the exit point, I can look at the data. Now, if they're using an extra level encryption on top of that, like they're visiting a site that's using HTTPS, that's that's uh, much better. Although there's still people who could use a Moxie Mullen Spikes uh, SSL strip and possibly cause some confusion there. So it depends on how much you trust that exit node. And I'll be talking about some incidents there. Besides just looking at the traffic that's going out that ex at, at uh, exit point, the person could be modifying it also. So imagine someone sets up an exit point on Tor that uh, injects malware into whatever pages you're viewing. Completely possible. Or they can inject other things that can reveal your identity, which I'll talk about here in a bit. There's actually been incidents of this. Like there's the, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, uh, Dan, uh, Dan uh, Egerstad. He did something called, people some people refer to it as the embassy hack a while back, back in 2007. Well, essentially, he set some Tor exit points, or at least one, and a bunch of people at embassies, they didn't want the, the government of the country they were in to be spying on them. So he said, we use Tor. 
and that was secure to get us out of the country, which is true. But they were using uh, non-encrypted protocols, for instance, POP3 without encryption. So they were sending a username and password essentially in plain text once it hit that exit point. So the guy running the exit point, Dan in this case, could sit there and sit the sniff the traffic. This could also be web traffic. This could be tons of different things. Uh, another example, uh, or a few examples of uh, plain text protocols that for those who don't know. These are protocols that there's no encryption by default. Uh, and the passwords might be passed in clear text or in an easily reversible format, like uh, Base64. POP3, SNMTP, HTTP, basic authentication, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Also, uh, Moxie Monspy with a SSL strip, like I mentioned before, was doing something similar to this. Uh, if you set up an exit point and use this, even though they're using HTTPS, his tool would sit there and go, oh, I'm going to redirect you to HTTP, and if you're not sitting there paying attention to what it says in your URL, you could very well get owned. I apologize for the incredibly uh, unuser-friendly URLs in here. If anybody wants to slide after the presentation, just let me know. Okay, to give you a quick video illustration of how these uh, untrusted exit nodes work, let's say you want to send some traffic. So this guy down here in the bottom left-hand corner is our client. He's trying to contact the web server way over here. And let me get that back up. All right, which one of these machines do you think is the bad actor? Which one's evil? The one with the goatee, of course. You all need to watch more Star Trek. <laughs> anyway, so at, remember we talked about layers of encryption? Well, we get to the first hop, a layer gets stripped off, gets to the next hop, a layer gets stripped off, gets to the next hop, a layer gets stripped off. So it's encrypted throughout the entire way, but each point only knows the person who just sent it to them. So no one knows both the contents, in theory, both the contents and the original person who sent it in. So that gets sent out the exit point, but at that point it's in clear text. The guy can sit there, look at it, sniff it, modify it, send it back. To modify it and send it back is where I was mentioning some attacks can be uh, put together for a really big effect. We'll get that in a second. All right, mitigation. Tor is for uh, anonymity, and I really wish there was a different word for that because I can't pronounce it. Not necessarily security. Uh, if you use Indian uh, protocols that aren't necessarily encrypted, the guy at the exit point is going to be able to see your traffic, just like if you were sitting on your local area network, or at least as far as anything going through Tor is concerned. So don't use plain text uh, protocols. Use something that's end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, also, if you're sending your username and password across these protocols, you're not very anonymous, are you? Especially these people. This is one of the things that gets me about, uh, I have a whole other talk on anonymous. Anonymous is something different now than what it was, or some people consider it. If you use a, 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 a username, like I use Iron Geek, uh, if you use that in both your anonymous or pseudonymous setting and in the public internet, you've kind of defeated the purpose there now, haven't you? So people who are sending uh, uh, public email addresses through Tor network, yeah, not so good. All right, some other common attacks, DNS leaks, and various other protocols and application level problems. A lot of people talk about traffic analysis and it's neat stuff from a signals intelligence standpoint, but I really think this is where uh, people will get bit. Okay, an overview. Does all the traffic go through the proxy? Fine, you're using a .NET, everything's encrypted, it's going through multiple uh, hops, so no one really knows who's talking to who, but what if you're not sending all of your uh, data through there? What if there's something about the protocol that's not quite right and it's sending stuff outside the .NET? A common example is DNS links, so I'll illustrate here in a second. Let's say, um, let's say I'm using Tor to visit uh, Secmaniac. So I'm visiting Secmaniac and uh, .com, correct? I'm visiting that, and I'm like, okay, I'm secure. All my traffic to him is encrypted, and it's encrypted back. But I don't want people to know that I'm visiting his site. Well, if there's a DNS leak, they might know. I'm actually sending all my traffic through Tor, but if my machine's not configured right, it could be asking the DNS server, hey, what is the IP address of Dave's box? Even though I'm not using it, if it's still asking the question, my ISP knows I'm visiting Dave's site. They may not know what I'm looking at, but that's still information. If you're visiting a Tor hidden service or an ITP Eat site, same thing. There'll be some string of characters, .ITP or .onion, and if you're not configured right, those hidden servers will be reported to that DNS server, which I'll illustrate in a second. 
There's other ways things can be leaked as well, though. Adrian? Yes. I'm not spending a lot of time on Barton next, so please excuse me. Later. So with, we see this stuff that we talked about with, uh, with Evan. Ponies. Yes. Yeah, when you see stuff that needs to be reported, you, you report My Little Pony copyright infringement. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you, uh, you report that to them. Are they going to be able to get to that site, or is that something that's ever changing? Depending on how if they use some of the weaknesses I have in these slides and the person didn't configure the server right yeah. and a bunch of other little ifs, yeah. it's possible to trace the stuff down. But there's no one answer to say, yes, you can find it. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's kind of off topic. But yeah, it, basically, it's really hard to report and you can report it, that doesn't mean they can do anything about it. Right. Or easily do anything about it. So basically, you have to make sure that the uh, .NET is configured and you go find out when we're talking kind of um, dual purposes here. I'm talking in some senses about how to protect yourself if you're using a .NET for admininity and how to catch someone who's using one. I find the whole interplay kind of like a game of chess where one side tries to outsmart the other. So I'm kind of preaching to both sides here. I just think the topic is interesting. All right. A snooper can also use web bugs depending on uh, how you have your proxying set up. For instance, let's say you have your browser set to send all HTTP traffic through Tor or IGP, but you forget about HTTPS or possibly, I don't know, FTP if for some reason there was a, a browser bug and FTP wasn't automatically sent through whatever the default proxy was. That would be an issue because the person could use that to embed a link inside of a web page, either a web page they own or possibly by injecting if they're the uh, exit point and find out who you are. I have uh, some code and some examples of web bugs. But essentially, a web bug is like, let's say, an image you put on a web page. And whenever that image is fetched, that IP is reported to, and various other information, is reported to the server that's hosting that web bug. <laughs> you can use that kind of thing for tracing people down. Uh, HTTPS is a good example I'll show because I screwed up this configuration before when using a IGP. Uh, but there's other application level stuff that's clearly a problem. JavaScript also is pretty hosed. Uh, go out there and check out uh, Gregory uh, Fleischer's uh, DEF CON 17 talk. And basically makes you go, yeah, JavaScript was a bad idea from the very beginning as far as uh, security is concerned, and especially anonymity in this case. But let's talk about DNS leaks for a second. Here we have a DNS query. Let's say that's some .onion address or .itp or even a secmaniac. Even though all my traffic going through the network from here to here might be encrypted, Bring it back up. Even though all that might be encrypted, that doesn't necessarily mean that it can't, uh, this person doesn't know who I'm visiting. Not necessarily what I'm doing, but they know who I'm visiting. That can be bad enough. All right, a few uh, ways of mitigating these kind of problems. Uh, push comes to shove, in Tor at least, uh, make sure you're not, um, or actually this one will Tor and ITP. You might want to put a sniffer and uh, use a libpcat filter like uh, port 53 to find both uh, TCP and UDP packets that are leaving on 53 and see if anything, any kind of uh, name resolution traffic is leaving that shouldn't. In theory, if Tor is configured right or ITP is configured right, you're not going to see that traffic. Hopefully. Um, if you're having some problems, one thing you might want to make sure, at least in Firefox, go in there and make sure that this particular setting in about config is set to true so it knows to use DNS through the SOX connection, through the proxy. Uh, this gets a lot more complicated in other um, in other protocols, like uh, where well, you have to configure this in like an IRC client to make sure it does name resolution. That varies from IRC client to IRC client. Same thing for secure shell. You can in theory secure shell into a box over a dark net, but you better be damn sure that you have that proxy setting set correctly. Uh, Tor button should help. One of the, when I use Tor or ITP, generally speaking, I use the Tor browser bundle and then just configure it so I can swap back to all, between both of them. And the Tor browser bundle has various settings already done for you to help with anonymity. Basically, stripping out certain information that might be returned by a browser, uh, user agent stuff, um, screen resolution stuff, I believe. Uh, don't use a bunch of plugins. That's another big one. Other applications vary, of course. Uh, you may also want to try just uh, firewalling off port 53 to make sure it can't go anyplace. 
and then the only way out of that particular box is the proxy. Also with Tor, uh, one of the things you can do is you can actually set up a local DNS server on your box, and then if you're worried about uh, DNS traffic going out, you can point your local machine's DNS server to point to local host, and it will resolve everything automatically from local host, and it won't ever talk to a domain name server. Oh, well, I will went outside the one running local host because of Tor. So that's a nice, uh, maybe over top in some cases, but uh, probably a more secure option. And you can make that little setting by editing your Tor or C file and putting in those flags. All right, grabbing content outside the darknet. This can be also be an issue. Now, this illustration, I have more of a mesh I2P kind of style uh, node diagram. But let's say some traffic is being sent through. Uh, if someone doesn't have uh, things configured right, they could be getting HTTP traffic through on I2P, but not, not sending HTTP, HTTPS through it. And by default, <sighs> HTTPS out proxies. All right, I2P does various modifications to the traffic to try to increase your anonymity. Uh, that's a, you can't really do that on HTTPS. And not me in this. There's been HTTPS out proxies, but um, I'm not sure this one up at this moment. But let's say you've only configured an HTTP one. Well, that traffic may be going through uh, I2P and bounce around and come back to you, and they don't know who you are. But if that web page hosts a file to like a web bug that is accessed via HTTPS, then uh, it's possible that you'll request that when you get your page back, and you request the image, and then I'll have your real IP address. This same kind of thing could happen if, um, this is more of a back in the day, but I think most web browsers don't, aren't as wide and loose on this as they are now. We used to see uh, URL lines, instead of starting with HTTP, it's sort of like telnet, colon, slash, slash, those kind of things. Uh, there was really a fun that could be had with that. Now, to make sure this doesn't happen, in I2P, I usually go in and uh, set this proxy right and say use this for all protocols, though this particular setting I have right now isn't necessarily going to uh, work for uh, SSL traffic as I recall. You can also set up uh, SSL proxies that should work, though I don't know if that particular um, Tor, so sorry, IGP uh, proxy is actually up and running at this point. The, uh, basically, someone has to, inside of ITP, say, yes, I'll be an out, and that's called an out proxy, and I'm not sure if anybody is actually hosting an HTTPS one at this moment. Okay, slightly related subject, similar thing. Let's say you're web surfing around in uh, Tor, and uh, you visit some website, and you're like, hmm, I want to do something a little bit more suspicious. So I'm going to go visit in, uh, well, you're visiting at, let's say, the public internet first, then you decide to visit over Tor later on so you can do something a little bit more, um, well, things, something you don't want to be known. Well, if you've got a cookie while you're surfing it over the public internet and you're using the same web browser, well, when you surf to it over Tor, you might very well be seeing that exact same cookie again. And Tor does, and Tor button has uh, various features along with, uh, what is it, Polypro, this little uh, HTTP proxy that's meant to filter out various uh, identity revealing information out of your HTTP traffic. There's various things to try to uh, mitigate this, but it is a concern if you don't have Tor configured properly. You get a cookie off the public internet, then when you're using Tor and you go to the same page, I'm sorry, yeah, go to using Tor and you go to the same page, that same cookie gets sent. Wouldn't be so good. There's no reason to separate your profiles and use different browsers for different tasks. Some of the things that we've done is uh, if you can make a hidden server contact you over the public internet, the last few examples I've given have been um, your client and you're contacting some internet site. In this case, you might be trying to uh, reveal the identity of some hidden server. This is a server inside of ITP network that you don't know its real IP address. You know its name, but it's bounced around in between hosts inside the network to be able to get to it. If you can contact it, let's say with an exploit, uh, let's say you had like a shell execution exploit for some bad web vulnerability on there. If you can tell it to ping you, well, game over, you can make it ping you from its real IP address. There's uh, mitigations you can do to this, though. 
Um, another example of applications that um, totally, uh, well, blow out all that anonymity is uh, BitTorrent. By default, a lot of ways people configuring BitTorrent whenever they use Tor is you know very wrong. There was a paper uh, written a while back. I have the names of all the authors down here at the bottom of this slide. Hopefully, that'll be visible in the video. Uh, where essentially they uh, found that most Tor users were only using Tor to hide the contacting of the tracker, the person keeping track of, okay, this peer in this uh, BitTorrent transaction has this part of the data, this one has this part of the data, this one provides this part of the data. He basically tracks who has what so they can set up communications between the peers. Well, if you're only sending that kind of communication to the tracker over Tor, you're still contacting the peers directly. That's revealing your identity right there. Um, also, though, it, on the exit point, let's say the person decides to, uh, that you're contacting the track over, decides to modify the data, they can add their own IP address as, yeah, I'm one of the people who's participating in this BitTorrent. Contact me, and when you contact them, there's various identifying information they can go, oh, okay, that's who you are. Also, uh, depending on how the client's configured, uh, another mode of operation for BitTorrent is to use what's called a distributed hash table. That's over UDP. Well, Tor doesn't really support UDP, so that gets sent out to the distributed hash table, and that can be scraped for information. It gets somewhat more secure. Now, most of these are mitigated if the person decides to send all traffic, including peer-to-peer -peer traffic through Tor, though that would be dog slow. But the distributed hash table one, that's not mitigated. Because if your machine starts using the, uh, the trackless torrents, and it's sending those packets out via UDP. If someone's out there harvesting the distributed hash table off the internet, they could possibly reveal people's identity. So there's all sorts of information inside the BitTorrent protocol that will reveal who's who. And a lot of this traffic actually has like peer ID and port number. And so just from the ground up, it wasn't exactly designed for anonymity. There's certain um, Modifications have been done to like the one that exists inside of I2P that makes it a lot better. But uh, generally speaking, BitTorrent over Tor probably not such a great option. Okay, yet another example of an application that uh, will uh, screw the pooch, so to speak, is IRC. By default, even if you configure IRC to go from Tor or I2P. There's some things on the protocol level that will screw you up. Who is familiar with IDENT? Basically, it used to be a Unix, uh, a protocol on Unix boxes to be able to say, who's this person contacting me? Well, inside of uh, IRC clients, you can say, what's your IDENT? So that when someone does a who is on you, like right click and says, give me info on this person, or does the who is command, they can find out your username on some box. Well, you can set this information, but depending on the client you're using, it may default to your actual username. For instance, one time I connected to I2P as a as what I thought was fairly hidden. Then I started looking around and looking who is it, everybody, including myself. And I realized that while I had a pseudo name while I was using I2P, if anybody did a who is on me, they could see that Adrian at some host name, not my real host name, but still Adrian at some place was contacting and I was that particular identity inside of I2P. Well, there's only so many agents probably doing research on ITP. If nothing else, it's reduced the anonymity set, if not outright reveal who I am. Or let's say um, if that particular ident information we build relic as the I start getting his attention. It revealed inside ITP, let's say he was using the pseudonym um, some dude dot eighty five. And when you did the ident on it, it said relic. That'd be pretty revealing. Now, you can fix this kind of problem by actually going in to the IRC client and configuring what you want it to return as far as ident information. But uh, by default, depending on the IRC client, it may reveal more information than you actually want. That would be an example of an application that uh, just kind of gives up too much data. All right. General mitigations. Make sure your browser is, of course, set to uh, send all the traffic to the .NET, which I illustrated some of that a bit ago. Look in the firewall rules to block all traffic that's not going out through the protocol, uh, through the particular ports that you know your uh, .NET client is using. Limit plugins used, of course, because this can totally mess you up. Because the plugin can be used to uh, reveal more information about you. 
depending on whether or not it knows to actually use it on a, the uh, browser's proxy settings, for instance. In the past, uh, I think it was maybe like Flash and uh, Adobe Acrobat didn't necessarily honor the proxy settings that were configured inside the browser. If someone can send you the right payload, they could possibly uh, get you to contact them over the public internet and then know your IP address, which a little looking around later, then I might be able to find your identity. Use a separate browser for different uh, tasks. Also, there's two great sites for going to check out uh, how anonymous you are from a standpoint of, well, one, dcloaker.net tries a bunch of different uh, techniques to reveal who you are. Like, you'll try serving up a PDF and see if your browser stops using your cloaking uh, service, and instead it reveals your real IP address. It does that with uh, Word docs also. It tries a bunch of different ways to try to reveal who you are. Uh, Panopticlick from EFF is something a little different. It basically tells you uh, how unique your particular browser user agent string is, as well as like various information in JavaScript and plugins returned to the site. So it can say, you are unique amongst so many different people, or like how many people share your exact identifier. Uh, let's see. Hidden server-wise, make sure you patch your stuff. If you have like a really out-of-date um, version of some web application and someone can use some sort of shell injection and get it to ping them back out on the public internet, that's a bad sign. So make sure you keep your stuff patches. Also, you could just try not running the box on the public internet, have it on its own virtual host that can only talk to the, let's say it's in VMware. You could have uh, a guest OS that can only talk to the host OS I think how this would work. All right, let's say you have the web server inside the VM or just a regular box. The web server is configured to only respond to 127.0.0.1 and not send traffic any place else. But the service that is coming in via the darknet is allowed in. Basically, the idea being to make sure that that service can't contact anything else outside of um, outside of its own little network. I'm trying to think of a better way of explaining it. That may need a future diagram. Okay. Attacks on centralized resources, infrastructure attacks, and denial of service attacks. This is not so much against individual nodes as the network in general. I suppose you could try the denial of service uh, individual, like hidden service or each site inside <coughs> of the dark nets. Uh, but more likely, a lot of the, at the uh, attack will be uh, blunted by of a host in between you and them taking the uh, well the blunt of the uh, damage. I've heard people suggest that, well, if you want to stay anonymous from your DDoSing site, first of all, people who think DDoS is a political statement irritate me. But um, people say, well, why don't you just use Tor to hide who you are? Because if you try to DDoS through Tor, you'd end up essentially denying of servicing Tor. You wouldn't necessarily contact who you're trying to hit. Well, you would, but at a greatly diminished uh, ability. There's all sorts of um, uh, denial of service attacks out there. Salvation attacks, essentially, maybe let's say you're a node or you're several nodes in the network. You can promise certain resources and then not give them. Partitioning attacks where you want to separate the network into subgroups. So if you know this one routes traffic for this part of the network and this one routes traffic for a different part of the network, you take out these nodes. You can cut down their anonymity set of what you have to search. And of course, there's flooding, you know, your general denial of service sort of attack. Uh, Or you describe that. Oh, attacks on shared known infrastructure can be a problem. For instance, let's say someone starts denial of servicing uh, Tor's um, directory servers. Well, that would be a huge issue because then people wouldn't be able to necessarily find Tor routers and wouldn't be able to use the network. Also, total or severe blocking of the internet would be a huge problem. You can't have an, if you don't have an internet connection, then you're really not going to be able to use the dark net. There's been a few cases similar to uh, some of the uh, things I just talked about. For instance, China, back on September 25, 2009, blocked access to Tor directory servers. So people who were using Tor in a normal fashion couldn't actually connect. They couldn't find a list of routers to hop through. Uh, also, Egypt, Libya, and Iran, they blocked internet access. Well, you can't get on ITP if you can't get any internet access. I suppose there's a possibility of a net split, but that might be beyond topic here. For instance, Tor directory servers. If someone blocks that connection to Tor directory server, well, you ain't using Tor. With some exceptions, we're going to talk a little bit about um, 
bridge nodes. Essentially, a bridge node is a Tor router that's not advertised directly by a Tor directory service, and it's not supposed to be one central list these anywhere. Essentially, you can like email a certain email address at Tor project, and you'll get a list of uh, bridge nodes you can contact. And I think they occasionally um, send that, that information via other ways, or you can set up a bridge node inside of a country and then tell other people about it inside the country, and they can use you. But that basically just makes it so the authorities have a much harder time blocking all Tor routers. Once the person gets to one bridge node, hopefully you're golden. Uh, distributed infrastructure helps. For instance, I2P does not a directory service to say which node is which. It's all just taken care of in a distributed hash table called NetDB. Taking out the dev site might be kind of an issue, but actually all the development in I2P is also supposed to be done over I2P. So that might be somewhat difficult. Protocol obfuscation might also help. Uh, if someone doesn't know someone's using a darknet, they might not attempt to block it. Uh, Tor does this to an extent by trying to make the traffic look like uh, HTTPS by sending a lot of traffic out on uh, 443. Though there's some other stuff it sends that obviously isn't. Uh, I2P sends out via a random port. Every machine, you know, different uh, Tor routers out there, different Tor u sorry, different I2P users aren't necessarily using the same port. And if you're sitting there looking at the traffic, it should just look like encrypted gibberish. So that makes it I2P fairly hard to block. It's also sending stuff via, I2, via UDP and TCP. Total and severe blocking of the uh, internet, though, that takes a little bit more to mitigate. And there's some people talking about technologies to do that. If someone blocks all internet access, that's a bit of a difficulty. Or let's say like we're right here at, on the network um, at this university. We can't seem to connect out. We probably have no problem. We probably have a problem with Tor because as soon as it tries to uh, contact out on a uh, 443 and it notices it can't man the middle of that SSL connection, your connection is not going to go anywhere. So people come up with other ways of uh, getting around that. People are talking about making mesh and stored networks, uh, stored and forward networks. Essentially, these mesh networks might have um, different boxes in the country to have radio communications for each other. If you can each other. If you can contact one of them, you can hopefully get a message out by it hopping around until eventually it gets to some place where it gets to the public internet or whatever network resource you're trying to go for. Now, this may or may not always uh, work. It's also the concept of store and forward, where essentially, let's say um, you want to try and get a message out and real time is not necessarily something you have to worry about. Like, it's like Let's say it's an email. If it arrives now, if it arrives uh, two hours now, it may not matter. Well, if the mesh network is set in such a way that it can be passed along from device to device until a device gets in range of one that can get the communication out, that might be good. That might be uh, useful. But let's say uh, someone has someone on the phone, but that message from that phone gets sent to a node, and that gets into another node as they each come into range of each other. That might be an example of a uh, store and forward. All right. More info on uh, mesh networks. There's no real clear front runner. Didn't people have put up forth idea of projects to create their own like uh, darknet backbone so you don't have to worry about the internet getting blocked? Uh, you can go out there and check out wireless mesh network on Wikipedia for, and build link off of a few different projects that relate to this. Um, Kit Alpha is one project you might want to look at. Also, there was an article in the New York Times not too long ago about the U.S. actually uh, sponsoring some research in this particular area for like sending into uh, third world countries. All right, clock-based attacks. This is another uh, place where people can at least reduce the anonymity set of someone using a darknet. Some protocols allow you to check the remote system's clock. This could be an issue if, let's say they're not using uh, universal time, let's say they're using local time, well, there's only so many places in the world where it's 3 p.m. at any one moment. That gives you an idea of where the person is in the world. That reduces anonymity set. Also, sometimes people have clocks that are just plain off. They'll set them wrong or not have them uh, automatically updated via uh, a time server. So that'd be an issue. But uh, minor clock issues can sometimes be statistically analyzed to figure out where someone is. There's someone who did some research and tried to figure out where um, various Tor hidden servers were based on temperature. Essentially, the temperature of the area of the world they were in at that time 
would have an effect on the computer's clock and how fast or slow it ran. And they tried to do a statistical analysis to figure out where in the world the person was based on that. Now, the research that was done, as I recall, um, this is, I think it's a Murdoch's paper. If I recall correctly, he used Tor, but he didn't use the public Tor internet. The public Tor that's out there on the internet, he used his own um, internal like lab Tor because the public internet Tor, it was so much jitter. I don't know if you guys here use Tor and notice how slow it can be sometimes. There's just too much variance in there for um, you to be able to get good, accurate clock information. Uh, so he used his own. He might, I'm not sure if I'm, hopefully I'm quoting his research correctly on that. Uh, maybe for some better statistics and more collection, you could actually find the data. Uh, IGP, I've actually done some messing around with uh, clock differences there myself, though this was a more, um, this is a less accurate method and more of just checking clocks and seeing if they were way off from what they should be. When I was doing my research in IGP, I checked out various uh, EAP sites and essentially tried to see how many seconds difference they were for me in time. Well, if it's only a few seconds, that could be easily explained by network jitter, and because of all those hops you have to go through in the darknet, one of those could be causing the latency issues. It's causing that time difference. However, if there's only one of a host that's like 4,000 seconds different than me, and I'm getting my response time of only like less than a second, nah, I have a pretty good idea. If that's the only site out there uh, that's that, whose clock is that much off, that that's who it is. Uh, actually, I should explain this uh, table a little bit better. I essentially did a harvesting attack where I sat there and uh, logged every IGP user I could because I have part of that distributed hash table on my machine as far as uh, information about routers I can connect to. I logged all that, started hitting every one of those IP addresses to see if they had a website on them. If they did, I'd note the, uh, what particular uh, web service software they were running as well as what time they had on them. Once I had that information, I would also try to contact the EAP site I knew about and see if I could correlate them. Because they were hosting their EAP sites on a machine that also had a public facing address. And since I could query both, I could do a correlation attack and figure out who was who. Uh, an example of that might be attack at asks, hey, what time is it? Remote set, remote, uh, box says what time it is. And if it's far enough off, and it's the only one that's that far off, you might have a good idea of who it is. Um, mitigations, well, depending on how far off the clock is, I think this attack can be fairly hard to pull off. There's a fair amount of jitter in all these networks because it takes time to proxy that connection from host to host to host to host. Uh, so unless the clock is severely off, probably not going to be a big issue, I imagine. Um, having the clock set to a reliable NTP server would probably help. Uh, however, if you set yourself to an unreliable NTP server, <laughs> that's not really going to be particularly good. Uh, some mitigations uh, can take place in the .NET protocol itself. Like there's certain uh, timing things that are inherent inside of IGP, and IGP makes sure that people aren't too far off from each other. However, that particular uh, timestamp is internal to IGP itself. It doesn't reflect the uh, time of the hosted machine. So, not a perfect in that case, because the application layer, layer can uh, rebuild the identity. All right, another cool example of ways that people can uh, rebuild identities inside of darknets, metadata. We talked a little bit about metadata, I believe, in the first talk today. Essentially, metadata is data about data. This could be stuff like, you know, uh, the GPS coordinates, where it was taken, or what the username of the person who created it was, or timestamps on when it was last modified, or when it was created initially. And lots of document formats have metadata in them. For instance, JPEG, EXIF, uh, IPTC, doc files, docx, EXEs, all these have metadata in them that you can scrape for information. Some of the things stored, of course, I've already mentioned, GPS info, sometimes network paths. There's a cool tool out there called Boca. You can actually point it at a domain name, suck down all the documents you can, and sometimes by extracting data from the documents, you can find the names of like print servers and servers that that document has been related to. Uh, so you can find information about someone's internal network just from like a document they put out on the website. Way back in the day, back in uh, Office 97 days, it was actually embedding MAC addresses inside of documents. A uh, few uh, prime examples. I can't think of any uh, examples of people inside of darknets being revealed 
by metadata. But here's a few that on the public internet who had some run-ins and problems with metadata. First of all, Kat Schwartz. She posted a picture of herself online, and it essentially looked like the one you see up in the corner. And uh, she cropped it, and it was all good. She posted it. But the problem is, EXAF data inside JPEGs also has a thumbnail. Well, her thumbnail didn't get modified when she cropped the image, and it went down a little bit further. So uh, there you go. Another example is Dennis Rader, the BDK killer. At one point, you know, for the longest time, he was just like um, sending letters in. He went years and years and years without getting caught. Eventually, I think he hears that a book's going to be coming out or something, and he decides to start bragging, so he sends, I think it was a floppy disk with a Word document on it to the cops. Well, they get it, and they look at the <coughs> metadata, and it says author or something, Dennis, and had the, and since the uh, software he, where he, uh, the software he used was registered to the church he was working at, it had the church's name, so there's only so many Dennis's at that particular church, it didn't take too long to figure out who he actually was. Another example is uh, Nephew Chan. At one point in time on 4chan, he posted an image of uh, his aunt who was in the shower, and someone said, post all the rest of the images as long as we reveal where you are. When he posted, he apparently took the photo of his, his iPhone, and at the time, by default, my understanding, the iPhone was putting the EXAF data in there, GPS coordinates, so the people on 4chan were able to figure out where his uh, aunt actually lived. All right, mitigations, well, duh, clean out metadata. That'd be a good one. And, of course, it varies from app to app on how you do that, so I can't give you a one-size-fit-all solution for that. Okay, local attacks. At this point, it's probably a way of lost cause. Someone has seized the machine. Uh, they're gonna probably going to find out where you've been going. One of the nice things about um, uh, the Tor browser bundle is, by default, as soon as you close it, it doesn't log history or cookies or anything like that. Now, I haven't tested its privacy mode to be 100% sure that something's not leaking out into memory that may be leaking out to a swap file, but it makes a, it does various things to keep them happening. But let's say you're using Tor and you're going to various sites. Well, you might be encrypted and going through Tor, but if someone grabs the browser and, your hist and those particular sites are still in your history, they know where you've been. Pretty much if someone has access to your local box, your host. It's kind of like the old security maximum. If someone has physical access, if someone else has physical access to your box, it's no longer your box. Essentially, at this point, it comes down to traditional forensics, data on the hard drive, cache data and URLs, memory forensics if all else fails. Who has heard of like, the cold boot attack? All right, the cold boot attack was um, this. Let's say that someone had uh, the encryption keys up for, um, let's say they had it using full hard drive encryption, the encryption keys were up in memory, they decided to shut down the machine really quick. Well, within a certain amount of time, if someone could grab those uh, DIMMs out of the machine, memory DIMMs, and pull data off of them, they could recover that key. To a degree, this particular attack is somewhat academic because you have to do it really, really fast. For instance, you take your laptop and just <laughs> hold it out like for 20 seconds and keep it away from somebody, they'll probably have a problem recovering the data off of it. But uh, there's a guy who's been some, doing some research on um, uh, de-anonymizing, or sorry, doing forensics on live CDs, where memory forensics comes into play. All right, as far as mitigations, there's of course anti-forensics. If you don't leave logs on the machine in the first place, that's a great start. I have uh, a class I've done on a, what I like to call occult computing, in other words, hidden computing. Occult directly means, the word occult, I believe, is originally Latin for uh, hidden. Uh, essentially, anti-forensics is techniques that can be done to uh, fraud forensic analysis. So that particular uh, video might be worth checking out. Also, people who use live CDs or live USB drives, they can avoid leaving some tracks. Because a lot of these, well, since the CD is uh, write-only media, well, depending on what you... Let's just go ahead and go with it. You know I'm technically wrong, but since the CD is write-only media, uh, you're not going to leave logs on it necessarily. Uh, same case with a lot of USB drives. It's not actually writing back to the USB drive. It's loading something up in memory, running the OS. But as soon as you pull out the USB drive and reboot the machine, in theory, everything's gone. Well, uh, Andrew Case, he was messing around uh, with actually doing forensics on memory. So let's say someone seized the machine while it was using a CD or while it was using one of these boot USBs. They could actually grab data from memory and figure out what the person's been up to. And his uh, Black Hat slides are out there. 
I've contacted him. Hopefully, he's contacted the Black Hat folks, and he'll be able to get a, a video of his talk out there. Because full hard drive encryption would also go a long way in mitigating all this. Okay, we'll get into some more academic attacks at this point. How am I running as far as time? Uh, you can have as much time as you like. Probably we should run much more in the next few minutes. You think you can do that in 20 minutes? Yes, hopefully. <laughs> All right, civil attacks. Uh, when I first heard the term civil attack, this isn't even used any place outside of academia. A civil was apparently a, uh, there was a character in a book who had multiple personalities, and her name was Civil. The idea of a civil attack is essentially. Uh, it's like a sock puppet, if you're familiar with forms, where someone poses as more than one person. The idea being, by uh, being more than one person in the network, you can influence votes or routing uh, decisions and that sort of thing. I like to refer to them as sock puppets instead. A lot of times these are not necessarily the attack in and of themselves, but they make other attacks easier. For instance, if you're every node in the network but the uh, end point and the beginning point, well, you can figure out who the beginning point and end point is. That's a very worst case scenario. But it basically makes a lot of the other attacks easier if you have uh, multiple nodes. But let's say this one guy in the corner is evil and he decides to set up more than one node that he controls. He can have these collude to find out more information. For instance, let's say you were incredibly unlucky, and yes, Tor and ITP have mitigations against this. Let's say you were incredibly unlucky while using Tor and you connected the three boxes as your routers and all three of those were controlled by the exact same person. Well, uh, you're hosed. Mitigations. There's no absolute fix to this. You can make it cost more to have nodes in the network. Uh, and who else has ever heard of proof of work algorithms? Okay. Uh, way back when, uh, the, one of the ideas put forth to uh, stop spam was to use proof of work. Basically, before a mail server would accept any kind of message, you had to solve some mathematical algorithm that was easy to check but hard to do, so it would keep you from being able to send as many messages as fast. For various, uh, I guess, logistical reasons, that was never really that never really took off. But the same technique has been used in other places, like uh, Bitcoin, for instance, making it making it where people can mine these bitcoins, and it's easy to check whether or not something's a valid bitcoin, but it's hard to generate. Another example might be um, password hashes. If someone gives you a, the word, it's easy to check if it matches a hash. But taking that hash and figuring out what the original word is, is doable with massive brute force, but not necessarily time practical. Uh, I2P and Tor both put in a restriction to where they try to keep the same slash 16 uh, IP addresses from being in consecutive hops. For instance, let's say your IP address of your institution was 123, 123, something, something. Well, it would try to keep those two from being one hop and the very next hop. The idea being that if someone wants to try to make a bunch of colluding nodes, they might all have them on their own little IP network by themselves. So basically they try to keep those separate. Another example of that might be for jurisdictional reasons, having a route, traffic route from one country to another to another to another to really confuse boundary issues. Um, central uh, infrastructure may be more resilient to this. <coughs> Uh, however, it also has its own issues. If one central point is deciding who's who and who's doing what, then that's one point of failure. But if you really secure that point, in some cases, that might be a mitigation against civil attacks. Uh, both ITP and Tor have uh, peering strategies to try to keep you from talking to people consecutively who might cause you an issue. And uh, there's been some academic research done with uh, things like Civil Guard, uh, uh, civil limit and civil, civil infer, uh, infer that try to um, base who you connect to based on who you know. The idea being is that you kind of know the people in your network and that nodes that are bad actors won't know as many people so they won't be used as regularly. But um, who's here with, and it seems to revolve like social networking to decide who routes what traffic where. I've seen a couple problems with this, however. Who here is familiar with Robin Sage? Oh, what was the name of that security researcher who did the Robin Sage uh, stunt? You know, I don't really it was a cool thing. Well, anyway, what this guy did is he decided to make this um, very cute girl who was an information security researcher. He started like uh, making like, I think, a Twitter, maybe a Facebook profile of her, and he said, tried to see how many people in the industry he could get to connect and contact her. 
and end up getting a ton of people to add. How many people out here have people in their Facebook who they barely even know? I'm thinking using social networks as a way of controlling who peers of who may not be the best issue in the world. Though, you might want to read the papers. It's, the arguments are probably a little bit more fine-grained than that, than, than I'm giving them credit for. All right, traffic analysis attacks. Uh, there's a lot of academic work on these. Unfortunately, it takes, well, unfortunately, all fortunate, depending on how you look at it, it takes a much more powerful adversary to pull them off. I really think that uh, if you're using a .NET, you should probably be more worried about application layer stuff, uh, revealing your identity. But we'll talk a little bit about traffic analysis attacks. There's a lot of subtle variations on a profile in traffic. It could be stuff like, um, well, I'll get to the illustrations to be able to do it. Uh, you could be something like um, timing of data exchanges. It could be the size of the traffic. It could be the ability to tag traffic. Let's say the encryption algorithm allows people to still modify the data. If someone can tag it and change the data, they can track it throughout the entire network. Generally, this takes a powerful adversary. And it's really, but it can be somewhat hard to, to defeat in low latency networks for reasons I'll show you in a second. Um, but anyway, what I mean by low latency network, there's networks out there that would be kind of stored forward where, let's say it's a mail message. It hits one node. If it takes 10 seconds to get to the next node or it takes an hour, if it's an email, it may not really matter that much. However, for web traffic, that really just wouldn't work. Web traffic would be an example of something that's low latency. A lot of these attacks involve uh, timing. I'm going to step up back. Uh, a lot of these attacks involve timing. And if you know this particular person sitting in five uh, megs of traffic, and this other one received five megs of traffic, all from a certain time period, those kind of time correlations you can use to figure out who's talking to who. Uh, when I was just looking at I2P, I started thinking of it from the standpoint of looking like this. I was like, well, how would you really be able to do traffic analysis on this? So, so many different people are talking to each other over one-way uh, connections. But from the ISP's viewpoint, you can only have one connection in and one connection out. They can kind of sit there and uh, watch traffic. Now, I just try to sit there and Wireshark and try to figure out which uh, pair was which. And I knew the right answer because I was able to go into I2P itself and see who my partners were in the communications, and I still had issues. But to give you an example of um, correlating traffic, let's say some uh, client sends five megs in, and another one receives five megs and sends out eight megs, and that same one that sent five megs in earlier just received that eight megs. Even if you can't read the data, you know who's talking to who. Uh, it could also be things like timing, like uh, certain uh, protocols apparently send a little bit of data, there's more data, Wait a little bit, send some more data. That timing can also reveal information. Uh, also, things can be done to uh, affect timing. This is where civil attacks can help uh, augment uh, traffic correlation attacks. Let's say someone's sitting there just watching the timing. That could reveal information. They can also try to attack different servers out there or different nodes of the, the dark net and say, OK, I'm going to cause a denial service here at certain intervals and see if I can correlate how this affects traffic in other nodes, and by doing that, figure out who's talking to who. They could also um, just sit there and kind of control how fast the traffic goes through them. This would be similar to a tagging attack. The way uh, at least I2P works is it signs the data, so if someone starts modifying the data, that's going to be an issue. But I suppose if you slow down the packets a certain amount and put a certain rhythm to them, you might be able to uh, follow that along the line. There's also been people who've done various attacks in Tor to try to change the load on certain nodes to try to figure out who's talking to who or figure out who's going through which nodes and reduce the anonymity set as well. Now, the general mitigations for this would be things like more routers. The bigger the network is, the harder it would be to find. It would be like being a needle in a much bigger haystack. Also, uh, people have talked about using entry guards to make sure the first hop that you're connecting to is not necessarily... a uh, how do I put this? If you're both in Tor, the first hop and the last hop in a network, it's really easy to figure out who you are and what data you're sending. Because if you're the exit point, if the attacker's the exit point, they'll see the unencrypted traffic, assuming you're not using an encrypted protocol. If they're also your first node on the entry point, they see the amount of traffic you're sending. 
it's much easier to figure out that this person is the person who was sending out this data that ended up coming out this exit point. So Tor does a couple of things to uh, mitigate this. One would be entry guards, where it chooses a certain set of uh, people to always contact. If it randomly chose people to peer through randomly every single time, eventually an attacker would be both the exit point and the first node that you hop into. However, by uh, choosing a certain set that you always use as your entry points, yeah, it's possible you'll be really have really bad luck and um, choose a, a malevolent peer that very first time, but at least it reduces the chances of having it eventually happen after you send enough traffic. There should be a better way of explaining that. Hmm. All right, one-way tunnels can help, and it definitely seems to confuse information, at least while I'm sitting there trying to um, sniff traffic in I2P. Short-lived tunnels may help, so you're not sending as much traffic through the same nodes. Basically, you use these sets of nodes to route through for a little while, then all of a sudden you change to a whole new set of nodes. Uh, Better profile to figure out who's bad actor. Like if you know one person only hops on during certain times or they only seem to send traffic certain ways, that would be an issue. Uh, signing of the data, which I believe, I know IGP does signing of the data to make sure it hasn't been modified. I'm pretty sure Tor does as well. Uh, fixed speeds is another issue. Uh, some networks have been proposed to where they keep people doing their timing attacks. They basically make it to where it always sends at the same speed or they put delays on traffic. Like, for instance, if you're sending an email, an email relay doesn't necessarily have to send it instantaneously. If you're worried about timing attacks, you can have it wait a certain amount of time before it sends on to the next node. Unfortunately, that really doesn't work in low latency networks. Uh, padding and chafing, if you're worried about... <laughs> chaffing, sorry. Um, if you're sending data out there... <laughs> totally different thing, guys. Uh, if you're just sending data out there and you're worried about people doing uh, analysis on the amount of traffic you're sending, well, if it's padded and it's always the same size, then that could be used the traffic size to figure out who's who. A chaff would be kind of the opposite thing, like someone sends out a bunch of data that's padded, and then all of a sudden they start dropping off the unneeded data before they send off to the next node. So that the sizes of data going uh, and packets going between this node and this node and this node can't be easily correlated. Uh, Non-trivial delays would help in some cases, and that goes back to some of the stuff I covered earlier. Uh, intersection and correlation attacks. This can be related to uh, some of the earlier attacks as well. This can be as simple as knowing uh, who's up when a hidden service is available. For instance, let's say you notice, let's say you log all the people you know who are inside of I2P, and you log whenever this one particular each site, this hidden web server is up. If you notice this one particular IQP router is down at the exact same time that this each site is down, and it's always like that, that might be an example of a correlation attack you could do. Um, techniques can be used to reduce this anonymity set. I suppose if someone starts uh, knocking off various machines on the internet, like I denial service you, the each site's still up. Okay, that must be not be you, and so on and so forth. Um, Application flaws can also reduce the anonymity set. I mentioned before when I was doing some research in I2P, I was checking for what particular web server software each machine was running. Well, if I logged all this and I know you're running this particular version of Apache, I can only check boxes that have that particular version of Apache. I've reduced the anonymity set and I've reduced the number of boxes I actually have to check to see whether or not it's the same person. And this also goes back into harvesting attacks of being able to log all this data and profile the different uh, nodes in the network. Here's an example of a, a simple correlation attack. Let's say someone uh, contacts, ping wouldn't be a good example, let's say they're trying to contact a uh, Tor hidden server, they go and check to see whether or not it's up, and then they check every other node in the network really quickly to see if they are up. Eventually, if one is down at the same time as the uh, hidden server, that might be an idea, give you an idea that that's that same person. Now, unfortunately, this attack, well, fortunately or unfortunately, on a really big network would be difficult to pull off. But it's a really simple example of a correlation attack. Uh, another one might be, um, let's say you know the IP addresses of a bunch of the routers, and you know one of these routers actually hosts the, an EAP site. You might be able to find out uh, what software that EAP site's running <coughs> 
Then all the IP addresses you've harvested out of a uh, distributed hash table, you can check each one of those to see whether or not it's running the exact same version of the software. Then each one of the ones that is running that same version of the software, you can request that site. For instance, um, this is one of the tasks I, I was doing. Let's say there was a site called some site that IGP. I might request it directly and go, okay, this is the server software you're running because you're returning that information to me. All right, now I'm going to check every IP address I know to see who else has that same server software. Now, in my host header, in my HTTP protocol, I'm going to request that particular website from you. If you return that website to me, I know it's you. And I was able to de-anonymize some people in IGP that way. General mitigations, of course, more nodes will help. The more nodes there are, the harder it is to pull off these attacks. I think I was only dealing in IGP with like 6,000 nodes at the time. And it was doable on my home machine with a, a cable modem. Uh, but the more nodes you have, the more difficult that would be. Given, by the way, IGP has since done some extra work on it where if you're hosting a server inside of IGP and it's an HTTP server, it strips out that server software uh, uh, header. So it's not as easy to correlate. They implemented that, I think, sometime uh, late last year, early this year. Giving less data, of course, a lot makes it harder to pull out these kind of attacks because you can't reduce the anonymity sets. You have to check more nodes to see. Uh, see what they can do to make harvesting and scraping more difficult, though. Oops. Let me back up a second. They can see what they can do to make uh, harvesting attacks uh, harder to do. Uh, for instance, uh, well, I guess a good example of this might be I uh, was mentioning um, Tor. Um, Tor bridge routers. It's easy to harvest Tor uh, routers because you can just access the directory server. It gives you all that information. However, bridge uh, routers, you can't easily harvest because they don't put all the information in one place. They slowly distribute it out. That might be an example of uh, making harvesting and scraping harder to do. If you want more information on IGP specifically as far as de-anonymizing, I have a paper out of my website on it, which I'll link to here shortly, as well as a video. Okay, we're almost done, I promise. If you want to have more information on uh, various uh, research into uh, anonymity networks, check out uh, the archive that Freehaven has. Also, if you want more information on different threat models, IGP has a great page on that. Uh, I have a general .NET talk that I did uh, earlier this year here at AID. And uh, I also have a video and article on de-anonymizing de sites inside of IGP. I'd like to say a quick thanks to the conference organizers for having me here. Tenacity for helping me get to DEF CON. This is actually my practice session for this particular talk. Hopefully I'll have a little bit more polished by the time I get to DEF CON. Uh, my buddies at DerbyCon and the ISD podcast. As, uh, and also the uh, Open Icon Library for helping me out with a lot of the artwork. A few events I want to mention are coming up. DerbyCon on September 30th through October 2nd in Louisville, Kentucky. The day before that is Louisville InfoSec. Come for both if you can. And there's a bunch of other conferences throughout the year I'd recommend attending. Skydog Con, Dojo Con, though I'm not saying I don't think there's going to be a third one. I'm not sure on that yet. Hacker Con, which is going to be happening uh, in uh, October, correct? Uh, Freaknik, of course, Nauticon, and Outer Zone. Finally, are there any questions? Sorry if that was like drinking from the fire hose. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, if, if anybody comes up with questions later, I'll be at the conference till the end of it, so just let me know.